Hi, a very good morning, Harvest. Um, if you're watching this video, um, it's because of uh, I've not been very well over these last few days, and uh, I'm really sorry I've not been able to make it this morning. I've got a bit of a chest infection, which I wouldn't pass on um, to anybody. So uh, here we are on uh, this video, and I, I, I hope to do uh, justice to this great uh, passage in Colossians that um, we're picking up to today. I'm going to come and read the scripture just in a second or two, but when we start to read it, you'll see that we, we are actually turning a corner in the book of Colossians. For those of you who have just joined us over the last uh, five weeks now, this is week five, we have been following through uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians in a series entitled Jesus Is, and we've been looking at the, the full glory of what it is to be in Christ as Christian people. It's so amazing truths. And to uh, heed Paul's warnings uh, about the things that can distract us off into um, you know different areas and not trust in Christ fully. Uh, now, I haven't got time to go back through all of that, of course, but you can catch up in previous episodes on our YouTube channel, and uh, I'm sure you'll find that helpful. Anyway, we come uh, today to the beginning of a turning point. Up until now, we've had Paul uh, speaking about um, kind of um, doctrinal issues, uh, pointing out who Christ is, pointing out the you know some of the ways that we can fall away from him. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, just to prove that I've got the cough. Uh, the, the, some of the ways that we can fall away from him but in, in two weeks time we're going to come to chapter 3 and in chapter 3 we start to see some very practical teaching about how we should act out this Christianity in our everyday lives and the passage which bridges the theology if you like through to the practicalities although that's theology as well is this short passage which we're going to read together from Colossians chapter 2. So if you'd allow me I'll just like to read uh, this passage about six verses uh, and then highlight one or two things from it for us. So here we go this is Colossians chapter 2 uh, 16 through 23. Paul writing therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, and the head is Christ, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you have died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, asks Paul, as though you still belong to that world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And so, Father, we pray as we open your word this morning that you would uh, direct our thoughts, our hearts, our minds, our spirits to you. Holy Spirit of God, come and make your uh, word alive to us this morning, I pray in your precious name. Amen. And amen. So, what we find in that uh, passage, if you'll take time over the week, I'm sure, to, to read it through more thoroughly, is that there are three very relevant warnings uh, of things that could bump us off course in our Christianity. Now, the great thing about having these warnings, it's not to make us feel bad, but uh, it's very hard to be surprised if you're ready. You know, somebody coming up behind you and going, boo, make you jump out your skin. But if you know that they're coming, it doesn't work like that, does it? So as far as these warnings are concerned, Paul, the pastor, Paul, the church leader, Paul, the apostle over this series of churches is warning the Christians then and us today about some things to look out for. 
Now, the context for the Colossians, as you've heard over the past few weeks, was this whole concept, um, which is alien to Christianity, that, uh, that faith is Jesus plus. That, in fact, the assertion was that Jesus by himself wasn't enough for a full and true Christian life, which we know is not true, as we've heard over these past weeks. So our focus is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Give me an amen for that, even as I'm not in the room. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, knowing that if we do that, we are safe and secure in him. Now, this uh, text that we've just read breaks uh, comfortably into three kind of chunks. So if you've got your Bible with you or on your phone or whatever, you might like to just track as we go through. What are three warnings that Paul highlights here for us? The first of them is this. Don't be distracted. And we find this verse 16 and 17 of the passage. Let me just get my Bible here. Uh, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Why? Verse 17. These are a shadow of the things that are to come into reality. The reality is found in Christ. So for the Colossians, distractions were from incoming teachers <coughs> who um, were raising up a number of things that were supposedly to help them, but actually were a distraction to their faith. There were food and drink rules, which we know were over and above what the Old Testament even demanded of Jews uh, by the fact that it's got drink rules included in there. Uh, there was all the thoughts about festivals, and if you look closer, you'll see there's annual festivals, there's monthly festivals related to the moon, and obviously that relates to other spiritualities that might have been in the, the city at that time, and then there's a weekly Sabbath. So there's all this all these ideas going on, but how are, why are they distractions? Well, Paul says they're distractions because they are, however helpful they are, they are a shadow of the real thing, and we are up for the real thing, aren't we? We want the real thing that Christ has promised us, the freedom that, it, that we find in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this uh, nicely illustrated in a, a little game that I used to play with my children and I now play with my grandchildren. Um, the, the, the image here just on the screen might, might give you a, a bit of a clue. I don't know if you've ever done this game. If I'm the only one that's ever played it, then oh, oops, but try it. Uh, on a sunny day, I know in Scotland that's few and far between, but we've had a few, uh, get the sun behind you so that it casts your, sh your shadow in front of you and then play with your grandkids or your kids this. I'll, I'll, if you can jump in my shadow, you get a point. <coughs> Excuse me. And you're doing the same to them. So what you end up with is a lot of running around trying to jump in each other's shadows. You run forward, you run backwards, you run side to side and all that kind of stuff. Kids love it and adults and grandparents uh, absolutely love doing that kind of thing too. So what Paul is saying about these food rules and about these rules about calendar and keeping all these dates and all the rest of it is that for the Colossians and what they were being taught by these false teachers is that they were very much a distraction from the centrality of Christ. I mean, I go back to my little game that I, that I, that I play. Well, it's amazing that when you start doing that game and you try to keep jumping on each shadow, each other's shadows and score a point and all the rest of it, you, you don't actually end up looking at the person uh, just naturally. However, here's the trick. If you look at the person, you can see everything that they are and their shadow becomes easy to follow. So what am I suggesting here? I think what Paul is saying is that we need to look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. In him, in Christ, is everything that we need for a life of godliness. And so what other things that are around, don't let them distract you from the Jesus at the centre. I mean, it's so easy in church life, isn't it? You know, that the little things, and well, let's face it, sometimes there are things that are not quite right and there are things that are not to our preference and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, things that are just, just challenging. Isn't, wouldn't it be a shame if those shadow things, those little things, distract us from Jesus? Oh, let's pray that every time we gather Harvest Church, we continue in the way that we've been going, that Jesus is at the centre. Uh, he's at the centre of our individual lives. He's at the centre of our community. When we talk, 
Sunday morning, here we are. When we have coffee afterwards, let's talk about Jesus and all that he's been doing in our lives. If you find yourself distracted off on your shadow things, why don't you just talk to someone about Jesus and what he, he means to you? This was the warning that Paul was giving that being distracted is not going to help you. The second warning that he gives is this. Don't be disqualified. Now, this is a contrast verse um, with one that is earlier in Colossians chapter uh, 1. Uh, we read it on week 1, in fact, where we, we read this. We give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And all that was by Christ and what Christ has done for you. So what we get here in this uh, letter to the Colossians is in chapter 1, Paul tells us and re uh, reassures us that we are qualified to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light, i.e. eternity, both here and in the future. We are qualified by the Father. And then a chapter later, where Paul is saying, don't let yourself be disqualified. Wow, that's crazy, isn't it? We are qualified by Christ and disqualified when we lose our connection with Jesus. They were teaching in the time of the Colossians that other things uh, fitted the space in our lives that is meant for Jesus. When I think of the world around us right now, in my neighbourhood, in Hamilton, uh, South Lanarkshire, in the nation and nations, we know that this is something which is going on at the moment. I've been really heartened to see the, uh, hear reports rather of hundreds and thousands of people coming to Christ in these past few months and very many of them are young people who are realising that what the world promised them has is, is, is not promised them anything it's promised a lot and delivered very little and so th what I'm getting at is that the space that was in their life for Christ has been filled with hedonism and a whole load of other things, uh, all different philosophies about which we have spoken over past weeks. But the joy of our lives, what keeps us qualified is that Christ is at the centre of our lives. We are recipients of what he's done for us. Through Christ, he has qualified us to be in eternity with him. As soon as we say it's Jesus plus something else, we are disqualified. Wow. I want to read that again. As soon as we say faith depends on something which is Jesus plus something, we are disqualified. Now, I don't know if you've ever been disqualified from anything, but uh, the most heartbreaking one I saw was, uh, I think it was last year, I went to uh, the, the, the Sir, I want to say Ian Hoy, what's his name? Um, oh, Sir Hoy's uh Cycle, cycle track um, it was a race anyway and uh, the, the British team were racing uh, other teams from around the world round and round they went uh, and, and, and in one particular individual race there was someone that we were really cheering for uh, that was out in front won the race miles ahead it was absolutely amazing the crowd went insane we were jumping up and down and you know uh, amazing stuff and then a few seconds later the crowd went quiet and I was wondering what's going on and then we realised we saw it on the scorecard that the said rider had been disqualified and it turns out that he'd been disqualified for cycling around the track and allowing his wheels to go inside the white line at the inside of the track apparently if your wheels touch both wheels touch that line or you cross over that line uh, you're disqualified um, and what was a great and joyous moment was translated instantly into a, a moment of sadness and annoyance, let's say, uh, there. How much more for our eternity and the eternity of our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbours, our fellow Scots, that they would find qualification for eternity in Christ and would not be disqualified. Oh, I say this to you, dear friends, I'm, I wish I could be with you to to look you in the eye when I'm saying this, is I would love it for no one in this room to be disqualified from eternity because we've added anything to Jesus. We are qualified by all that he has done in us. Come on, let's get an amen for that. And we hold on to that. Don't allow yourself to even to begin to think that you need something else in your life other than Jesus. You know, he is truly and properly God. 
and truly and properly man we we read we did all that read that on on week one he is the visible likeness of the invisible god he he is everything and we are qualified to be with him in eternity now and forever because of what he has done jesus first and foremost in our lives come on harvest give me an amen for that let's continue harvest to be a jesus church where we are individually in him where together we are for him where together we are sharing him with the world around us and to where we together worship him both on a sunday and in all the things that we do in the week jesus only is the qualifier for our lives so the third and final warning here Allow me to have a quick drink. <coughs> Thank you so much. It's found <coughs> in verses 20 to 23. Uh, commentators acknowledge that this is a difficult uh, little passage to interpret. So I've done some study in it and I'm going to try and su uh, set, summarize it really in, in this heading and in a little paragraph. So the warning here is don't be deceived. Don't be deceived uh, and I say these are complicated little verses but uh, let me summarize them is this the deception comes from the flattery to deceive that comes from the world the law and the flesh and if you take some time to read through those verses you'll see the world is mentioned the law is mentioned and our flesh is referred to too so let's just quickly look at um each of those in turn um <coughs> in verse 20 we read this since you died with christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world so we're thinking about the world first the elemental spiritual forces of this world now this is uh, actually a very pastoral word from Paul uh, we read uh, very similar verses in Ephesians chapter 6 where he says this and reminds us of this our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms you know what this little passage of three verses is drawing up for us is the tension between the freedom we have in Christ and the slavery that we had in our lives without him. Now we often sing that uh, new hymn don't we? Uh, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. The freedom of Christ is, is brought into our lives is phenomenal. And uh, I loved last week that Naomi explored uh, quite a lot of that in her message. So go back and, and listen to uh, Naomi's message from last week uh, in which she outlines so wonderfully that our enemy, enemy wants us in slavery and in capture to our sin. He'll do anything he will to deceive Christians uh, and he'll use any method against you that would deceive you into thinking uh, that the world, uh, the law or, the, or your flesh is more important than Christ. But we are people of freedom, aren't we? So here's some things to remind yourself of in reflection out of those verses. Verse 20, just say to yourself, I don't belong to the world anymore. Now, by the world, I think the picture there is of everything outside of us, around us, uh, outside of our spiritual life. So when we're thinking about the world, it's not a particularly evil place per se, but it's all of the things around us. But I don't belong to that world anymore. I belong to Christ's kingdom. That's what Paul is saying, is that you've died to this world. Why are you trying to get back into it? Because they were being deceived. I am free from the captivity of earthly things that will push me around. Say to yourself, I will not be deceived. Christ Jesus is all in all to me. You see, whenever we face temptation, whenever we face, you know, uh, we, we sense our emotions or our spirit dipping, this is the this is the antidote, is to declare that Christ is all in in all to us he is everything the world might promise us that you know pressures around us provision around us might promise us lots of things but we only find what we really need in christ jesus you see our enemy enemy wants us to doubt jesus i read a, a great little quote when i was preparing 
uh, by a commentator called Dick Lucas, and this is what he says of this verse. Since the world rejects the truth of Christ, it must find its religion elsewhere. The elemental spirits of the universe are glad to oblige. Oh. Now, here we say to ourselves again, we declare fresh over you, I declare fresh over you this morning, that we will give no attention to anything that, that attempts to meet our needs outside of Christ. He is my provision. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my love. He is my security. He is my future. He has dealt with my past. He's with me in the present. He promised his Holy Spirit, come on, to be our comforter, our teacher, our strengthener in our lives. And I'm so looking forward to next week um, when in Pentecost Sunday we'll be celebrating the gift of the Holy Spirit to us. Isn't this amazing that he has given us absolutely everything? Dear friends, Harvest Church, we will, let's just pledge right now that we will give no attention to anything that attempts to meet our needs outside of Christ. That's a deception that the world can meet your needs when it's only Christ. In two weeks time we're going to start looking at some of the practicalities of that in our marriages, in our workplace, in our families and all, all sorts of different places like that you'll see in chapter 3. So that's uh, Paul's warning about the world. He also uh, warns us about the law by saying this and again Naomi covered this uh, beautifully last week so I'm not going to give a lot of time to this. Suffice it for me to agree with her that the deception of religious law is that it deceives us into concentrating on temporal things for spiritual solutions. Shall I read that again? It deceives us into concentrating on temporal things for spiritual solutions. So therefore, again, let's just get some positivity. Let's just declare that we are not going to be deceived in this way. I will, we will celebrate that Christ is in me. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Come on. It's not temporal things. It's these supernatural things that come from the power of the Spirit. I choose to be a person who lives by faith and not by sight. The law was good, as Naomi reminded us last week, in drawing our attention to the fact that we have no hope except with Christ. And so we celebrate that Christ in me is the hope of glory. And finally, the, the final warning from Paul is of that of the flesh. And we pick this up in that a, a strange little verse in verse 23. Um, we'll just pick that up there. Uh, These regulations have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack, why this is a deception, is because they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now let me just unpack that just for a little bit. This is talking about the flesh, that is about our humanity, uh, which uh, our own thinking, our own philosophies, our own self-directed lives. It's when we take the controls of our own life or have failed to surrender them to Jesus. There might be people uh, in the room right now who have never surrendered your, you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. Well, today's the day um, because without him, as you've heard already, yeah, your future is different. With him, your future is in freedom, in joy, in peace. But these things that we have, we, we make up ourselves effectively, uh, and the Colossians had all these teachers coming in and making them up, they appear as wisdom, but actually they're, they're false worship, he says. They're, they're, they're play-acting worship. They're false humility. That is, there's pride at the very centre of this. And this harsh treatment of the body that they're talking about is the ascetic approach where, um, you know, as you, as we heard a few weeks ago, this whole idea that um, Gnostics were teaching and teach that the human flesh is evil in itself. All matter is evil. It's only spiritual things that really count. But Christ was a real body. Christ was a real man. Christ was a real person who surrendered his life physically so that we could know him. And Paul is quick to point out that this um, any kind of philosophy of religion that is about what I do to my body and, and punishing it, and, and obviously there's a place for dis discipline, but in punishing it in order to have spiritual progress 
is actually a look at me scenario rather than look at Christ. All of those are deceptions away from the truth that in Christ we find freedom. In surrendering to Christ, we slay pride because in surrendering, we find true humility. And many of us uh, gave our lives to Christ years ago. We surrendered our lives to them. But isn't this a daily thing to do? To daily surrender our lives to Christ is a true act of humility. By doing so, I'm saying, Christ, I need you in my life. I need you today in all the meetings I'm going to go to and all the places I'm going to travel to, in my school or my college, my university, uh, with my friends and in the neighbourhood. I need you today. Who do you want to bless through me? I surrender my life to you and live in all humility. We say in a verse that we'll come to in a couple of weeks' time, Philippians 3.16, I will let the word of Christ dwell richly in me. What a joy. So there's his three kind of warnings that Paul is bringing to us. Warning against distraction. Warning against um, disqualification. Warning against deception. And I'd like to finish uh, before I pray just with a quote from um, a commentator uh, writing about this passage. Uh, I just love this. Um, so forgive me just reading it to you. To summarise these complex warnings, says the commentator, we may say that Paul's concern is less the Col Colossians lapse into a new religiosity originating in human beings. Wow. In this sense, and only in this sense, is Paul an advocate of religionless Christianity. Religion, inverted commas, as a term, is not adequate to stand for the new revelation Christ has brought to the world or the redemption believers enjoy in him. The religion of this world is just as surely condemned at the cross as the sin of the world. The Christian, that's you and me, listen to this, is set free from religion as this world understands it, to have the new nature whose life is described in chapter 3, which we'll come to in a few weeks' time. Now, I'd just like to pray for us during the week as I've been praying for you and for this moment. And again, I was expecting to be with you in person uh, to bring this message. Um, I, I had a bit of a picture, of, I believe, from the Lord, um, which summarises some of the thoughts that I've been having here today. And in that, what I saw in that picture was a cross. And uh, on that cross were inscribed various symbols of other religions, other um, religious bodies, other uh, faiths which distract from Christ being at the centre. Some of the things that are in and around in our community, which is a message for another day, uh, but the gods of our world are stamped on that cross. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me that the greatest danger that we face is not uh, um, separate challenges from different uh, philosophies and so on but it's the subtlety that we allow that to come in and be added to our Christianity. I hope that makes sense and so what I want to pray is a move of the Holy Spirit of God right now to purify our faith in him. So Holy Spirit of God join me would you just put your hands out in front of you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Holy Spirit of God we ask that you would come in your power and in your manifest presence and cleanse us inside and out of any thought or action that puts anything in addition to the freedom that we find in you. Christ Jesus, come, be the centre of our lives afresh. You give us the very air that we breathe. And so we return it to you in surrender and humility today. We banish from our lives, our households, anything which is a distraction away from you. And we ask Jesus that this church would be known to be a Jesus church. That we'd be a people who love you, a people who follow you, a people who with greater compassion and generosity serve our neighbourhood, tell others of you, and communicate the sheer joy and peace and love that we have 
from your hand. So bless us to that end, Father God, I pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much. Again, sorry I couldn't be with you. I'm going to hand back to Heather now and uh, she's going to continue in prayer. Thank you.